to the Delling Pod with me, James Delling Pod. And I know I always say I'm excited about, about this week's guest, but actually, this week's guest is really different, and I reckon that he is going to make a lot of special friend avatars very, very happy. This is going to be a convers- This is going to be a cartastic conversation, <laughs> uh, and the cartasticness is all going to be on one side because I know bugger all about them. But my special guest knows loads about them. His name is James Ruppert, and he's written a book called "Demotorized." The 200-year war on the motorist. So I think it's a bit of a bit of cars, a bit of politics. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, James? pretty much. Yeah. Um, and you've come, before I go on. Yeah. You came in. It, it, you drove to my house in a car in a BMW, and I looked at it and I said, because I, I don't know enough about cars, I said James, is this a really shit car or is this a really good car? And you told me it's a really good car. It's a really good car. It's a really cool car. Yeah. Um, it's um, for complete anorak nerds out there. It's an E twenty one BMW three series, which means it's the first series. Um, of of the uh, of the three series model that was the model that basically broke broke it for uh, BMW and established them um, as you know uh, the maker of premium cars in Europe. What so what year are we talking here? Uh, my particular car is 1979, but they date from 1975. Right, to okay. 82. So is it seventies? Is that considered now to be just the really classic era? Yeah, I, I think things are shifting forward and forward as people get get older. It's cars which were very relevant when they were younger. Um, so you're actually finding very early 60s cars and 50s cars are falling out of favour because everyone who drove those is dead now. Um, but 70s cars and 80s cars and very much 90s cars, 90s hot hatches people are very into now. But because it's because people are they're in their sort of middle 30s to late uh, 30s can afford to buy a really good version of the car they always promised themselves or the car they crashed um, and reversed into a hedge or whatever yes. um, 20 years ago. So it means a lot to them. That's so true. But the but the upside of my vehicle is it's 40 years old, so you don't pay tax. And I really like that. And also I can go into low emission zones. So um, as well as being cool, as well as being really good to drive. And uh, it's got, you know, it will keep up with the modern traffic. There's 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 nothing wrong with it. The only downside is if I crash, I may die. But apart from that, it's got a lot going for it. So you die because there's no airbag? Yeah, there's no airbags. Um, there's, it's actually not too bad in crash protection for the era, um, but compared to modern cars. But the best thing is to do, and it, it concentrates your mind wonderfully, is not, not, not to crash. And I think if more people did that, we'd have safer roads. Yes, although it's not always in your control. Uh, no, it isn't. But I think you can do an I mean, do you, awful lot. Do you drive? Do you drive like a like an old woman? Is that what you're saying? Uh, you drive defensively, especially like if you've have you had, <laughs> if you've if you've ridden a bicycle, if you've ridden a motorbike at any point in your life, you actually learn to see problems as they come up. And if you speak to racing drivers who drive on the road, they actually drive well within the limits, and they're very. Um, I spoke to one racing driver who said that he never listens to the radio. He would never have a radio on or music on because he thinks that's a, a distraction. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, a bit worrying. Yeah. And, oh, and, and do they drive within the speed limit? Yeah, the, yeah, I, th- I think they do most, do most they? of the time. They are, absolutely. Uh, but the, I'm talking to a chap who, who was the first dig, a chap called Perry McCarthy. Right. Um, and he did all the uh, Top Gear stunts in okay. the old days. Uh, but he, he was very, very, you know, a- a- adamant that he would never... Um, um, you know, com- com- compromise his his concentration, and uh, he was very, you know, he he basically thought people don't pay attention. And of course, they don't, because um, that's the way modern modern cars are. They they're designed to make things as easy as possible, and that's something I do cover in demotorize as well. Cars, you know, we're we're being dumbed down. You know, when you can press a button and you can parallel park by a button, then that's taking away a skill. Uh, that it is, people that's won't true. have yeah that's right so in few years part people won't be able to park it'd be as simple as that if there isn't a button to press and i think that's what they're trying to do they're trying to de-skill us so that um you know we we'd have no reason to actually drive and that's where the this the self-driving cars comes i don't think anybody actually asked for a self-driving car because at the end of the day that used to be a minicab you'd find out for a minicab and that would take you somewhere um i i really don't think many people Certainly people who like cars don't want self-driving cars, but I, but I think for most people, I, they haven't thought about the, you know, the, the, the long game. Where is this going? Where, where is you know, self-driving cars taking us? It's taking us to a future where we don't own cars and we won't be able to, we won't be able to decide where and when we actually go to various places. Yes. Well, playing devil's advocate here, mm. 
Um, why shouldn't one? What, what, what's not to like about having cars that just kind of take you from A to B without you having to concentrate? You can get your work done. You can read a magazine if magazines still exist. When when you can do all sort all sorts of stuff. Um, you can you can save time. Yeah, I suppose there is there is an argument for that. And if you're very rich, which is probably going to be this is again where where we're going the the ordinary person who just wants to get to work or just wants to commute just wants to take their kids to school um it has no relevance to them at, at all but again if you if, if you want to be driven there's there were things called chauffeurs in the old days um, but i, I suppose quite, there's, that's there's quite labor and cost intensive it is absolutely uh, but i i just don't see what the upside is for people being able to do this it's you know it's uh, as a as i say I, I i think there's there's an underlying reason why they why they don't want us to drive it right anymore they really do want to restrict us and i i talk about they but i explain who the they yes, is yes actually do go on because yeah. otherwise we're going to sound like kind of um <laughs> they've got lizard heads and absolutely pull well, their well, muscle. <laughs> they they could well have um, it's quite dangerous to go down this whole route when you start to question things because people do think that you're mad. Um, you take the red pill. Absolutely. And uh, um, you can either think, yeah, fine. Uh, I mean, I, I can go into the reasons why I've actually done this book and that might be, that might be the best... I think you the, best, the best way to do it. Okay, last year... I was invited onto Radio Five, um, and it was a there was um, a report came out in the middle of last year. It was an all party uh, report from uh, Parliament, and it was to do with the future of the car. And basically, they said the future of the car is it, it won't exist. They were against private ownership of cars. They wanted to ban um, uh, diesel cars and petrol cars and have electric cars, and eventually ban electric cars they also said there as well and uh i don't think people thought yeah I, I mean i was invited onto the program to sort of stand up stand up for the car so there was obviously a bbc presenter who was against me and there was an environmental lady who, who was obviously against me that's and, that's that's standard uh, that's, B bbc uh, <laughs> procedure by the way very very much so and you were the token freak i was the token freak i was yeah i was the one saying but yeah i don't think you know this is a very good idea um and we can extremely fast forward and everything is coming to pass at a furious rate. In fact, we, we may only be 12 years away from banning from the sale of brand new... This is My Michael Gove's plan? Y yeah, that's right. Which is which is interesting. I mean, mm. on, on a, yeah. just an anecdotal personal note here, Gove is not... He's not Banorzik. He's not very good at driving. He's not interested in cars. So... I, I do find it slightly odd that somebody somebody who really doesn't give a toss about cars and never has done and never gets it should be in charge of deciding whether the rest of us get to drive them. Well, this is it, it, again, it was something that we, we didn't really get to vote on or, or if we wanted to vote for the Green Party, then that's fine. That's very clear. Yeah, if you want to ban cars and you want to change, change the way tra transport is, vote, vote Green or vote Labour or vote, vote whoever. But we seem to have had a Conservative government that doesn't seem to be very Conservative at all, especially when it comes to this. Yeah. So when I was on the radio show, obviously it, it was two against one. Um, the lady who was the environmental lady still had a car because obviously it was very convenient. And so that, in a way, that, that scuppered a whole argument and reason for being there it seemed mad but i was ganged up on um and they and they even said what about the children to me they even used al gore you know al gore a completely discredited film a discredited man when it comes to anything to do with the environment and I, you know i just said well, look i said i'm very very old and i just remember being frightened by this i personally wasn't frightened but i, just, I think i found it amusing when i was younger but when they said well petrol's running out they said there's going to be an ice age there's going to be yeah. uh, uh, you know uh, raging fires um but there was all sorts of you know we don't hear much about peak oil anymore do we well it's, peak oil is, a, is another one that i go down because yeah abs absolutely we were, we were told yeah by you know the year 2000 you won't be putting petrol in your car because yeah. there won't be any petrol and yet there's more there's more oil around than than ever and they, nobody seems to be explaining this but they've actually changed the definition of peak oil. They're, they're talking about peak extraction because we'll move to other things. They're not saying we're running out anymore, whereas that's what they said in the 70s uh, and 80s. So. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, so it, it, was, it was just the fact that there seemed to be a lot of ignorance. And I didn't see many people, apart from me, sticking up for the car. You know, I don't see the AA or the RAC. Um, that's this is noticeable isn't it it is you, 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 mm. now how is that you're, you're right you've got you've named two motoring organizations mm. there 
that ought to be really fighting tooth and nail for the motorist. And they seem rather to acquiesce in the the establishment's attack on them. They, they seem to accept this managed decline attitude. Yes, they do, uh, because they're part of the uh, establishment. Um, I mean, I asked all motoring organisations in, in the UK five questions that I put at, at, at the back of the book. And there were only about five organisations actually that, that actually replied to me. The AA and the RAC were amongst the people who completely ignored me. I re- rang them re- repeatedly, left messages, emails, and they were not interested in answering my really five basic, not controversial questions. And I said to them, I will reprint what you have. I won't comment on it. It will just say, this is what the RAC said about the future of cars. Yeah. They weren't interested in doing it at all. So, mm. so, and actually the only people who would do it are the Alliance of British uh, um, motorists who um, are, you know, by comparison to the ANREC, like a grassroots, and they will, but they don't get airtime. You never, you never hear them. No, I've never Hardly heard of ever. them. Oh, they're, but they're, but they're like on our side. They're like, for the, you know, yeah, let's drive. They're, they're very clued up on speed and, um, you, you know, roadworks and all those sorts of great things. They know exactly what's going on, but they never get the exposure. Let, let's pause for a moment. Um, you, I would suspect, are more representative of where the average British person is than the establishment. You can tell me more about the establishment in, in, in a bit. But surely we're still a nation of petrol heads. It, not without reason was Top Gear the most enduringly popular programme on BBC until it moved to, to Amazon. So do, do you sense a, a sort of grassroots support for your view I think I think it is with with all these things. I think it's with all what we have. We have a media who are completely and utterly biased. If you listen to the media about any subject, you would think, um, you know, you you know, you can get lost in the Bre- Brexit stuff. But when people are actually asked what do they think about things, I think they 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 deliver an answer that the media hate and do not like. If you ask everybody about cars, everybody needs a car, and it isn't just just for fun. I think half the time they just think, oh, people are just going to drive around and have picnics and so people don't. These are you know people. The car is a fantastic um, uh, tool. It's it, it, it's helped us go to work. It's helped us socialise. It helped us get educated. Pull birds. Absolutely, and um, Actually, I, it's never worked for me. I've never, ever, ever pulled a bird as a, as a result of having a car. And I had, I had a bloody opal manta when I was at university. That's a good car. I had an op- a red opal man- manta. I had the number of shags I had as a result of that car. I would say is zero. So I don't know. I, 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 I'm not convinced that girls girls aren't as shallow as they. You'd like them to be sometimes. No, that's absolutely true. I think, uh, 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 yeah, girls should be given a lot more credit. I think, um, yeah, they see they, they see, see through completely us. through us. Oh, yeah, God that's sake. right. We're so we're so transparent. Right. But the best thing is to find a very good um, woman to marry, and then you don't. Yeah, yeah, right. No, I agree. Like good. I I want to do a whole podcast at some stage on good wife material, and I want to. I want to. Ideally, I want to talk to a girl, a sympathetic girl about this, because I think it's one of the most underrated qualities in womankind, good Absolutely. wife material, which is obviously a range yeah. of skills. But anyway, back to cars. <laughs> back to cars. They are good for many, many things. They bring us, let's face it, driving a car, that feeling of, we've all, we've all had it, that feeling of liberation you get when you pass your driving test and you think, where can I go? I know I can go anywhere I like. All I need to do is be able to afford the petrol to take me there, and it's fantastic. And I can just go on and on and on. That feeling, there's nothing like it, is there? Absolutely not. No, uh, and I think that is what they what they want to take away from us. I think I think that's what people in government would rather us uh, look at um, a bus timetable and then we come to an interesting thing where where i live and where you live um i you know there is yeah there is no such thing as a bus i mean god uh, no absolutely no i mean and it it means and i know this from 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 my daughter my daughter would not be able to socialize she would not have a job she would not have had an education if there were no cars involved if we couldn't have dropped her somewhere or by the time she could drive then she could go and do her own thing yeah and uh, i think that's completely lost there's, there's so many surveys and again it's because everybody's based in london or they're based in a major city and they say oh young people don't like cars anymore they're not driving well maybe in london because you don't have to have a car because there's because there's a tube at the bottom of the road yeah. there's a bus going past every five minutes and there's uber and all of that uh, but out everywhere else the rest of the country and uh, 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 and again this is this is why 
what you see on the news, what you see reflected in the media is always incorrect because the majority of the country doesn't live in London. And one day they yeah. may they may understand that. Yeah, yeah. It's we we live in the remote sticks, as you can see, and we're a three car household, and you mm. you can't you can't survive on you you have to have certainly a car per adult because otherwise you can't get anywhere you can't get to the train station well, I, I use trains whenever i can mm. not least actually because yeah. i find driving nowadays longer distances um because the police are so hot on speeding now it's much much harder to, to, to really enjoy your journey like you used to i mean i mean uh, how old are you um actually i'm i'm in my 60th year i know i know i don't look it no 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 um, no. okay (laughs) so so you and i come from from pretty much the 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 same generation and as we've grown up we've seen the car go we we, we've probably caught the tail end of 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 cars being a a means of freedom and fun Mm. and because i remember my dad's jensen and his dad's my dad's succession of jags Mm. there was never any question that that driving a car was anything but fun and i remember we used to drive down to Salcombe, and I remember uh, I, we had a holiday home there. And I remember driving down in my dad's V12 Jag, and we'd, we'd, we'd take turns to drive. And I remember him berating me whenever I let the car go below 100. He, 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 he sort of said, well, well, look, what are you doing? We've got to get there. And I was thinking, yeah, but Dad, what about, what about speed traps and stuff? Um, and I remember coming down that, coming down that hill. Uh, when, you, when you get past Bristol... Yeah. That, uh, you, there's a sort of cut through the hills and then, then there's a, a, a down, a long down bit and the, and the police quite often wait for you on the, the motorway bridge. And I remember going under that bridge at about, about a ton and, and thinking, oh my God, are they going to get me and being absolutely terrified. But anyway, now they've got, as I discovered to my cost the other day, they've got these these cameras that can sort of see from space, let alone from a motorway yeah, bridge. that's right, the average, uh, average uh, speed checks. I got busted in North yeah. Yorkshire who apparently have the worst police I mean, you know, Yorkshire, North Yorkshire police can't stop you if you're a, a paedophile rape gang, yeah. um, grooming mm. and, and raping underage underage girls. But they're really hot on you going 80 miles an hour on a motorway. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, again, one of the fascinating things, you know, re- uh, um, looking into the book and the history of speeding. In fact, there were no speed limits until the 19... 19- 60s you had you you had speed limits in towns and things like that but actually we were trusted and there was a golden age in the 1930s where i know there were you know a fraction of the number of people on the roads and if they were on the roads that they were they were posh and they had a nice car but people were given um a a real freedom to actually decide how fast they wanted to go and i I think on the whole people people respected it um you you could still get uh, pulled off the road for um you know um having too much alcohol or driving like a lunatic so you know you it wasn't as if it was completely law- lawless but there yeah. was still there was still you know um a, a respect to say you know we 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 will allow you to drive as fast as you want uh and but you know you've 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 got to do it in a safe way and it's very unfortunate that that can't be done anymore although the capabilities of cars and when it comes to stopping j- d- dis dis distances and things like that is you know well actually that's a, so, so tell me yeah given motoring technology now what do you think this, should there even be a speed limit on the motorways um well actually they 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 have been floating the idea of raising um the speed limit to 80 but yeah. they're doing that because of electric cars and they're doing it because of car technology so that actually you will keep the same distance because of the radars on cars um, but again, this is this is one thing I'm fearful of. Is that yes, it'll be, but it'll only be certain cars allowed on the motorway to do it. My old Croc won't be allowed to do 80 miles an hour. But if you've got, uh, if you've got um, a Tesla, if you've got a Tesla, then you'll be then you'll be allowed to do it. It's I, I've noticed this. That this seems to be another rich person scam. That yeah. All the people I know with Teslas have so much money anyway mm. um, that. They don't really need the taxpayer to be subsidising their electricity points, which is happening at the moment. It seems yeah. to me. It's, it seems to, it seems to be a sort of uh, a reverse Robin Hood tax, where where the poor are being well, it's a Sheriff of Nottingham tax, isn't it? The poor are being robbed to enable rich people to drive 
Teslas. That's right. And it's, it's just the fact that um, the sub subsidy to actually buy an electric car has been there for so many years. It's been reduced recently, but it was still 5,000 quid. That's 5,000 quid of my money and your money. Yeah. I don't want to give someone 5,000. Again, if, if a technology is so fantastic, if a car is so good, people will buy it. It doesn't matter how much it costs. They'll, they'll want to go and buy it. So you shouldn't have to do this. So again, that sends alarm bells ringing in that, yeah, that, so there, there must be some shortfalls in this technology so that you have to give people money in order to buy it. But as you say, the, the people who buy uh, 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 Teslas are very well off anyway and they're virtue s s s signaling. I, I want you to tell me a bit more about the they because, <laughs> because I, the, one of the reasons I'm not dismissing you as a crazy yeah. conspiracy theorist is that the they you describe, I suspect, is is not dissimilar to the they that promotes and benefits from the the, the great climate change scare. I mean, yeah. there's a whole massive money making industry, and, and it, it, it's it's money making combined with that kind of bans debatery zeal that the left that, that the left has. So, uh, can you maybe enlarge a bit on on this they? Uh, yes, um, I mean it, it would have been. I mean, part of the reason for doing for doing this book, and I've done it in a certain way, in that I've I've tackled all the aspects of motoring. So I I've tried to make it a bit funny because that's one of the things I do I do in books. I, try, I like to put bad gags in there, but some of the people who buy my books have said this is like like my serious a a album, uh, in that there's lots of facts in it. But I felt I had to do that. But I also felt I had to because I've known. Uh, you know, I've listened to you o over the years and I know that you've said that if you go down the um, climate route with things and you get into science, then you you can get really lost. And there's lots of people can throw facts at you. And or, it, and it all gets... what, they, what they do mm. is they, they, they throw pretend facts. Yeah. No, since you mentioned it, I'm, I'm mm. just going to mention it briefly. Yeah. So I was at Durham University the other day and I love going back to Durham University um, to, to do debates there. And in the drinks afterwards, I was surrounded by a kind of um, a semicircle of undergraduates, like the, like one of the horns of the fighting buffalo in Zulu, and um, and they they gathered round me to sort of effectively berate me for being a, a a climate change denier. And what I find is that when they the scientific um, in inverted commas arguments for the climate change scare are so many and diverse that it is quite impossible to shoot them down uh, even if you're a even if you're a, a scientist so i i started talking about about look i said there've been pre times before in, in in within human history where the planet has been as warm as it is now and and there can have been no anthropogenic input because this was pre-industrial so you've got the minoan warming period the roman warming period and the medieval warming period and I thought that, that that this would be fairly obvious and a given. And then one of the kids started presenting me to this case that actually the medieval warming period was was actually man-made because there'd been some kind of because the wiping out I think of of people in 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 the Americas or something by by cholera or I, this was a this was a wacko theory I hadn't preferred heard heard before, but it was presented to me with with shining eyed zeal as though this is a really important point that I that I really ought to know about and I hadn't and and the idea that, that, that there could be any anthropogenic influence on climate in in the medieval period seems to be so astonishingly absurd and yet because I hadn't got at my, my, my fingertips the rebuttal I was left sort of thinking, well, where do we go from here? Yeah. It's just it I, I all I can do is contradict this person, which is not really a valid argument. So yeah, sorry, digression. Carry on. No, that's right. But all of this, you can go into so many different directions the whole time. Yeah. Um, the fundamental problem we have with with uh, the problems that we have now, it, it does stem to back to pol politicians. Um, it's that politicians want easy answers. Mm. So this is how we, uh, uh, with just two, with just two examples. Firstly, with the diesel e e example, is that first of all the there was the uh, climate meeting in uh, uh, Kyoto where they decided um, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So yep. CO2 bad, right? CO2 bad. So then somebody goes, you do realise that there's less CO2 comes out of the diesel. 
And so you say that to a politician, they go, oh, great. oh, right, fantastic. Okay, so we'll encourage diesels. We're, you know, we'll change the tax system. And the unfortunate thing is that manufacturers go along with this. You know, they are so craven and they are so beholden to to the politicians. They just go, yeah, okay, then we'll just make more diesels because I suppose we're going to make more money. But they don't. But they don't question it. So that's why we we you know. So they looked into it. Okay, so. Less CO two comes out, but then they never, never saw that all the all the noxious particles that come out, the really bad stuff that comes out of diesels. So that was completely missed. Um, and then when we come to electric cars, again, someone said to to a politician, "You do realise these are zero emission cars? There's no emissions at all." And a politician goes, "Really? Oh, well, we better all have electric cars then." So they're not thinking about. It. They're not thinking, you know, about. Um, the production of the batteries, not thinking about the production of the car, they're never zero, never ever zero. And again, yes, you, you can go, you can get into all sorts of figures with people saying, well, you know, after eight years that they pay for themselves and so forth. But um, uh, in in both cases, where we have the encouragement of diesels, and then we have now the the active promotion of purely electric vehicles, it's driven by politicians who see a very short term um, silver bullet answer to what, what, what they want. They want to keep people happy. They go, yep, uh, zero, zip, 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 you know, we go for zero emission cars. They're not zero emission at all. And this is what I, you know, I, I can't, I can't believe that again, AA and RAC, the very least that they should be doing is, you know, thumping people on the table and just saying, you know, this is completely wrong. How, how are they not zero emissions, Tommy? Um, well, they're zero emissions when they're driving around because there's nothing to come out of a tailpipe because there is no tailpipe but they have to be produced so there is there is a manufacturer involved in making an electric car so if you're scrapping an old car so you're getting rid of a car that's been made it's rather i mean my car has been made once 40 years ago so actually i'm doing the greenest thing possible i wrote a book called bangonics um, about 26 year, year, years ago it did very very well and, and the the word bangonomics has fallen into use and maybe i should have um, so copyrighted, copyrighted that in some way but it doesn't matter um, but there's lots of people that do that people have done it throughout time in that in that they've kept something going you know it's the it's it's the most it's the most green way of doing things repair things keep it going um, you know what's the point of getting rid of something you know just because it's got you know um, it's built in obsolescence because it's got a new color or it's got a new um, you know uh, silly thing um, again uh, there was a chap called Vance Packard I don't know if you've ever come across him and he wrote um, a book about called the wastemakers and he explained and this was in the 1950s about how uh, General Motors and Ford and Chrysler they would they would simply just change a little widget on on the car change the styling it was all exactly the same underneath but it would make people buy the next version of the car and that's effectively what we're in now i mean we are at peak car there's in a way there's not much more that you can do to cars and then people are very excited because of the fact oh now we have electric cars so it's, it's a reason to shift you out of your old car into a brand new car right. and we're being forced to do this by the government as well so yes it's, it's normally normally markets that decide yeah. this, and instead, government has decided to accelerate. That's right. This yeah. program mm. without considering the the cost, because I'm sure I've read somewhere that that electric cars, uh, the the process of manufacturing them, mm. and 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 the process of of the, you know things like the cobalt yeah. needed for That's their right. batteries, mm. which are which is which is very rare and That's right. it's mined finite. under un, yeah. mined under the most appalling mm. conditions exactly. in places like yes. Congo, I think. Yeah. Um, that that actually, their environmental claims just don't stack up. No, no, that's it. And also, once we all have electric cars, that that that's great. Then the environment is because they're already mentioning it now. Then there's pollution from tire wear and from brake wear, and they and they say this. They say, well, you know, <laughs> you know, you still get, uh, you know, you're still getting pollution. So you cannot ever please these people. No, hang on, do, do, so you, surely there's no more tire wear and brake wear than there is on a petrol device. No, I know, but then that's the excuse that they will use. They will say, okay, well, you've got an electric car. Um, I mean, also, you've got to um, research where the electricity to charge your car comes well, that, from. That's, that, sure, that's that surely come, the bigger worry. That is, that is a huge, yes. Yeah. Especially if, as seems to be the case, they're heading towards very expensive electricity. I mean, electricity mm. derived from offshore wind is going to be particularly yep. expensive three mm. times probably the amount that it, that, that fossil fuel energy yep. would, would would cost we're not exploiting our shale gas which no. would be the obvious route mm. towards providing the electricity 
that would that might fuel all these cars. Yeah. So, I think we're heading for something very expensive. Extremely, yes. I mean, when this was announced uh, two weeks ago, um, uh, Twitter, which is, is obviously a, you know a lunatic platform, but I said, you know, great, okay, we're all going to have to buy electric cars, but where is the electricity come from? But so many people have so much faith um, uh, in. Uh, off, off gem, just that saying. Well, off gem don't see there's a problem. Why are you concerned about this? And so that that is their answer. It's just like, yeah, don't worry. It's all going to be. It's all going to be fine. Um, so there's there's no questioning in it, of it uh, at all. And this is why I get very disappointed by uh, people who do my job, uh, which is which is write about cars. Is that really there should be a whole movement of people just saying, right, you know, let's you know let let's let let's bother people. Let's let's you know let's start a movement. Let's write loads of features. And here I am, I'm the only person who's written a book, which at the end of the day. Um, could finish my career because we go to say James Rupper is you know a lunatic, and uh, he should he should not be given any. <laughs> well, you do look quite like a lunatic. I, I mean, do. You, you do. You, you do look like Dominic Frisbee. <laughs> um, you know, you're one of them. You've got the beard. I know. And, and you and you. <laughs> but I I I feel your pain, my fellow James. Yeah. Because I look at the um, economics writers now in right, economics and business writers in, in the Telegraph, for example, mm. and I see people who ought to be writing about economics yeah. are instead endorsing every green shibboleth. I mean, and, mm. Ambrose Evans Pritchard has completely jumped the shark. Yeah. So has um, Jeremy Warner. And these are, I, I mentioned these because because these are writing in a, in a conservative newspaper. Yeah. And in, uh, in environment correspondents and science correspondents have all gone to the gone to the dark side and I'm thinking well hang on a second yeah. isn't your job to write about actual science rather than junk science yeah. isn't, isn't it isn't your job to write about real mm. environmental problems rather than imaginary ones about vanishing polar bears or whatever bullshit that David Attenborough was going to come up with on, on his latest series to do with walruses or, or whatever so it doesn't surprise me at all to learn that motoring journalists have dropped the ball as well you mentioned the car industry what why is the car industry so shit at defending itself why is it uh, well, the, well they've gone completely woke uh, i mean they are obviously big globalist companies but i mean if you're looking for help there uh, amongst their number um you just won't get it and you know they re as i said to you they should have stood up to um uh, the governments and said no going for purely electric cars is not correct. You see, Toyota and, and Honda did a very clever thing. They came up with a hybrid. It's it, it's the perfect match. It's not an ideal sort of car. You know, it, it, in a way, you've still got two engines. You've got an electric one and you've got uh, a petrol one, so it's complicated. But the Japanese are building it, so it's very reliable. Um, but what it means is you drive into um, a built-up area, it switches off. So or you're, you're just driving on, on electric. If they're so concerned about fumes, then a hybrid is absolutely perfect. You've got no range anxiety you can use it just like a normal car and that seems to, and that's a car they're going to ban so that again are they going to ban it yeah so that's they're going to ban the sale of hybrid cars so hybrid, why because it's because petrol engine bad oh i see so as simple as that it's as simple as that again they haven't thought it through whereas a, a, a hybrid for the majority of people if you if you thought oh well you know you make loads of jokes about you know Prius and Prius drivers and so forth, but at the end of the day, it's a very reliable Toyota car, and they will run for I hate hundreds. Them. Yeah, they're horrible things, and obviously really you horrible. get in the back of one, you know, when you when you get picked up by an Uber in London. But um, as a as a, as a technical mechanical item, it's it's brilliant because it will run on electric, and then when you're out of town, it'll 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 switch to petrol, so you can go down the motorway and you won't have a problem. You won't you don't have to plug it in. Again, if you follow these people who are borrowing electric cars, journalists borrowing electric cars, half the time they're in you know they're having a coffee. So yeah, I've just stopped for two hours to charge. You know, so I have a coffee. So you just think, well, if you had a real job where you you know you had to go and sell something in Birmingham, you yeah. wouldn't be able to stop for two hours. You know, okay, you might be able to catch up on on, on some invoicing, but it's it you know it's a constant thing about stopping and starting and where am I going to plug it in? Um, and again, if you borrow um, a car from a manufacturer, you actually get everything installed for you back at home. You will have a point installed for you. Ah, uh, um, so yes, I'm missing a trick. So by there being is a absolutely, yeah, not, absolutely. Not I think journalist. I think you should sign up to to become a motoring journalist. Um, but I mean, uh, I I wrote for the Independent for many years, um, who who actively hate cars. 
Um, uh, How did that work then? <laughs> it was, uh, I used to, I wrote for a magazine called Car, very well known uh, monthly magazine, and they had an association with when the Independent first came out, um, It Is Are You, if you remember the s- yeah. s- s- uh, s- strap line. And so uh, after they were going for a couple of years, um, they wanted um, car experts, so they got people from car magazines to do it. So I was one of them, and I used to write about used cars and do general features for them. Yeah. Um, so that was uh, always very, very, very good to do. And I think there was a, uh, uh, I emailed you about this. I, I, I remembered that I, I haven't come sort of just now to, you know, realise how badly we're treated by our politicians and masters. In 1997, when Labour were first elected, uh, they uh, they swore that they would get people out of their cars. That was way back then. Oh, and I thought it, yeah, And I thought it was fascinating to say, to look into what they drove. Um, now, this is something you actually can't do now because it, that was the early days of the internet. So you, you, there was nothing to go. I don't, don't think Google existed really then. So you couldn't Google it. So you had to phone up each government department and say, you know, what was John Prescott driving and so forth. And they, they would actually tell you. Right. Um, and they won't do it now. I sort of tried to do it a few years ago and they said, well, for security reasons, you can't tell you yeah. other things. But they could tell you all that sort of stuff. So I wrote this big feature and, and the independent printed it. It was fantastic that they did about what they all drove. But it was so controversial um, that John Prescott phoned up the Independent and then the Independent phoned me up. They were absolutely, they were scared out of their lives. They were, we've got the Deputy Prime Minister for you on the phone because he's really annoyed about what you've written about what cars he's got. And I said, well, I can write about cars if it's it's on your drive, you know, it's in the public domain. But he went went a bit nuts. Is this when when Prescott acquired his name to Jags? Well, he was known as Two Jags before that because because I did speak to him about because he yeah he did have two Jags but he always had a golf strangely enough uh, on his two drive. Jags and a golf two Prescott. Jags and a golf and uh, but it was quite fascinating and obviously at that time uh, famously Tony Blair had uh, a people carrier because he had all those kids and, yeah. and so forth but again it was just sort of saying well look and also the amount of sub- subsidy that the politicians got to actually drive a car so never mind about the you know the first class rail rail travel they would also get it was in those days it was something like 24 pence a mile you know it's, it's something that you couldn't even dream of just as a private motorist and that upset them hugely but that was the lot in a way that was the last time i did anything like like that so what what was the shocking revelation was it the number of cars they had or the quality of cars they had at, i think or? it was the he the hypocrisy uh you know sort of saying we're going to get everybody out of their cars well you better start why don't you all start and then maybe we might pay some attention to you but it was it was just the fact that they all needed cars like we all need cars like everybody in the country needs cars to actually live a life and uh, and work and get on with things. You can't do anything by a bus timetable. If you if you're if you're working a shift and you start at two in the morning, there's you know you're not going to get anything. People who live in the cities mm. have no imaginative empathy for mm. people who live in the, the country. They really have no idea no. how impossible it is to get around. I'm, and I'm sure special special friend avatars in in America and Australia and places like that li- who live in in the boondocks, mm. they're going to totally sympathize with this and be aghast at this this war on the motorist which is well, being conducted right. by townies well that's right but it's also rather rather like the parking in northampton i mean they, they there is workplace parking charges so that so that if a company has you know um you know a dozen spaces they will get charged 500 quid a year per space so but you know a, a, again it doesn't matter whether you do live in the town or or, or in the countryside if you if you had to get to work at two in the morning there's no way you 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 know a bus isn't going to take you there no. you know you you've either got to pay for a cab which is a lot of money or you've you've actually got to park there but you, again you're not doing it for fun you're not you're not doing it to show off you're doing it because that's how you get to work and i don't think any local politicians or national politicians take this into account at all um i need i need to make some coffee um and i don't know whether you drink coffee but i think i'm going to drink I it do. anyway um but before we go for our coffee I wanted to ask you, and we'll, we'll continue afterwards. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, your car, your 40, well, 1979, you yeah, said, didn't you? Yeah, it's 40 years old. Um, yeah. Apart from the, the lack of airbag, yeah. is it, can it do all the kind of road holding things that, that cars can do now? Or is it, is, it, is, it, is it more objectively more dangerous? No, it's a very comfortable car. It's a very sophisticated car. It's a car that if you drove it in 1979, uh, if you stepped out of an Escort into that, you go, wow. So it, it is that, that good. 
Um, and it's actually got air, air conditioning. Um, it was factory fitted air conditioning. So it's, it's, it's actually got a creature comfort from now. And what size is the engine? Uh, two, two litre. Two litre. Two litre six cylinder. So it's a, it's a large-ish engine, but it, it, it's basically a luxury small car. Because cars now seem to maximise engine uh, what I mean is that, that they seem to have smaller engines mm. and get much more out of them. Is that right? Uh, yes, they do. I mean, they're very, they're very, very efficient. Especially, you know, the uh, pet petrol engines they have now—they're fantastic. Um, because with all of these things, if you ask a manufacturer to do something, you know, make a car run on tin foil or you know, uh, uh, soil, I, I, I can guarantee you that they will, they will do it. But they're, they're just being led down the wrong path. I, I suppose what I'm, what I'm leading to is, is. In the way that we we had we had Concorde and yeah. then we lost it, yeah. And some previous guests have, have argued that that actually we we are we are losing IQ points yeah. every generation, and that one of the mm. symptoms of that is that we actually were more capable of high tech engineering and stuff in the nineteen sixties and seventies than we are now. And I was wondering in the same way. I mean, I, I've, you've got your your BMW. Yeah. I've got my Golf Four Motion with with its. Uh, four by four um 2.8 liter engine yeah, is, yeah. v6 uh is that a better car than they're building now well it's very different it is comparing um oranges and apples really it, it, it i like is, oranges yeah i know <laughs> so they're juicy it, it, they're <laughs> juicy in a way that apples aren't I, but I would like to think that ex potentially, I mean, it is, it's a terrible cliche that, yeah, I read Dan Dare and Dan Dare told me I would, I would be having a, a hover jet car. They promised now. us jet That's packs. what they, absolutely. And that's what, what I haven't got. It's, it's a bit like I'm watching reruns of uh, Lost in Space, the original 1960s I watched as a child. It was set in 1977. Uh, 1997 <laughs> right. sorry and uh you know families are not lost in space now so we we are we are just so 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 behind the time i'm very disappointed i mean i loved all that i stayed up to watch moon landings and all that sort of stuff when i was young i loved all of that and yeah um and again that's what you get with the environmental the environmental people are so depressing and so basically don't do anything um, that I, you know, I, I can't identify with, with that at all. It's like a, it's a very backward religion. I, I actually want things to be better. I would love it if, you know, if things were made better for us, but um, they don't, they don't seem to be. I'm sensing a book title there, actually, something like The Shittification of the Future, whereby the, the really exciting future we could have had and, and that the technology was inexorably leading us towards is being stolen away from us by by bureaucrats and technocrats and puritans and virtue signaling politicians who just don't want us to, to enjoy the fruits of of technology they want us to have a to go to a sort of well the travel around in coracles and 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 live in yurts and all that other extinction rebellion shit that's right well i quite look forward to co-authoring that book with you <laughs> well actually you, I, I, you can do it for me i i've got loads of really good ideas that i i never do because i'm just too lazy let's, ha let's have the have the coffee and then we'll, we'll talk some more a phenomenon i noticed what about 10 15 years ago is that houses you drive past a bunch of, of council houses or, or or sort of not expensive looking houses and you see parked in the driveway cars more expensive than i could ever afford or would it would think to afford and this seems to be a it seems to have spread all over the country. This is people buying their cars on sort of. It's not like HP, is it? It's something else. It's a right. Sort of yeah, they're uh, PCPs. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, in the old-fashioned days, it was it was like HP. But um, this is sort of, sort of a circle of despair, really, because uh, you 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 never actually own the car, so you will run it for three years. Um, you you can't run it over a certain mileage. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, yeah. You've got to look after it to an extent. You may have a package where which includes um, servicing and uh, and uh, and things like that. And after the three years, you give it back. Um, but there there is obviously uh, money that's um, still owed on the car, and it's a it's a whole program. So the only way to make it work is to actually buy buy another car yes. um it's a you know it's a it's a sort of a huge scam operated by the car manufacturers in that they they make so many cars they have to do something with so them. so it was essentially somebody devised this trick to pump yeah. prime 
the car industry, yeah. which was otherwise failing. That's right. Yeah, um, because they do they do effectively make more cars than they than they need to. Because car factories, you can't just turn them on and off like a tap. You know, they do have to work at a certain rate. So there's all they're always producing brand new cars. And again, there's always in, they will they will register. Uh, cars to boost boost their sales so that uh, the cars aren't actually sold they're just registered and they'll go on a dealer lot and they'll be actually those are the cleverer cars to buy because um, you're going to save yourself quite a few thousand pounds on those but effectively they are brand new they've just had one previous uh, keeper um, which has been the manufacturer or, or the or the dealer oh i see so so when you go go to one of these these car lots what do you what, what do you what are you looking for um, well, it depends what you want to spend. I mean, um, I come from the car trade. I saw firsthand people buy cars and then bring them back and they weren't necessarily the cars that I was selling. And you would say, well, it's only worth this because, um, you know, immediately you take it. It's the old thing. You take the car out of the showroom. It's worth, you know, maybe half, maybe 60%, maybe 70% if you're lucky. That's you know, within Yeah, absolutely. It is. I mean, again, people are buying cars because uh, it's show off. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a one up on next door. It's to make yourself feel good. And there's nothing wrong with that if you want to do that. But you've got to realise that you are losing real money. And I think people went for um, the personal contract purchase the PCP because it, it didn't feel like you're spending as much of your own money um, because obviously you're putting a deposit down you're paying a monthly amount um, but because it's it, it is an ongoing scheme you've either got to pay off the balance at the end or put it into a new car so that's why people are, are in this cycle because you just think oh you know I'm, I'm going to pay you know five six thousand pounds I'll have nothing to show for it I might as well get another car so, yes. so then so then people are in this cycle and, uh, and that's it and it's it's difficult to get out out of and actually for some people you can understand because they want an easy life you know that that's fine because they don't want the but car to break so down. lots of people all over the country were yeah. were persuaded to spend more money than they can afford yeah on this to get mm. get caught in this endless cycle where they have to keep spending more and more money yeah uh, presumably it doesn't make make any sense i mean i mean the happiest the unhappiest i've been with a car i bought a a Skoda Yeti, or I didn't buy the Skoda. I never owned the Skoda Yeti. I, right. I, using the system, yeah. and even at the end, they they sting you. Where the, there's a man comes around to your house yeah. and he examines every tiny, tiny scratch on the car, just in the, on the paintwork, and knocks off loads. That's right. Yeah. It, it's it's like being given a sort of rectal examination. <laughs> it's 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 really painful uh, and embarrassing. And you and you think I didn't want to sign up for this, whereas my Golf, which I paid for, I, I bought for two thousand pounds off yeah. eBay. I mean, it does cost me quite a lot every year mm. into at, at the garage. Is that, is, is that normal? I mean, should I be laying out five hundred quid here? Yeah, two hundred fifty thousand. It is. is it was expensive. If a, if a car is expensive when it was new, it's always going to be expensive to maintain. So right, that's always the best way to look at it. But still, I'm probably doing better you, with that car. You're than up I w- on the deal. That's right. And, and, and plus, you're having fun. Yes. Yes, that's true. So, is it going to is it um, this Ponzi scheme type thing? Is it is it going to going to implode at some point? Uh, it could do. Um, it depends if um, if there's um, a sort of a world economic shift and people um, start start defaulting on these things. Then then yes, it could do. Um, um, but certainly, this is the way that you will have to buy electric cars because you don't buy the batteries because you have to lease the batteries because batteries are eventually run run out and they have to be replaced. And and, and again, this is this is another elephant in the room that is never talked. Talk, 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 talked about, but as we know, with a mobile phone, with uh, a laptop computer, the the battery life decreases. So, okay, it might take eight eight years to to decrease, but they're very expensive to buy new, and they become unaffordable for all, all, all ordinary people. Um, in that, when you know, just somebody who wants to get to work. Um, can only buy an electric car the only ones they can afford are the really cheap ones mm. and that's going to have a very poor battery life but all these things again these these are not being explored now these these aren't being thought through there's no one in government thinking to themselves oh yes we should we should think about this because they're not clever enough so you're saying when you buy an electric car mm. you, you you're not really buying a, a car you're not you, you never really own own it or it's it has no value because the battery, which is what about the main component, yeah. is just going to run down to the point of, yeah. of uselessness. Yeah, it's going to be have to be replaced at some point. Um, and you're what? You, how many years? You say it depends. I mean, there's again because we're we're at such an early stage. Um, people haven't owned the cars long enough to actually 
find that out. But uh, right. what what people are saying that maybe about eight eight years, um, you know, you you will probably have to um, because there, there there are a number of cycles that you can have with all batteries, and once they reach their you know maximum amount of cycles that they can be recharged, then 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 they're done. Uh, and I think it's as low as seventy percent. You've got seventy percent in a battery. It's not good enough to have in a car anymore. All those. All those voters, those working class voters in the Midlands and the North who lent their vote yeah. to the Conservatives, I imagine they are your constituency. And I imagine that very few of them have any idea of what this government is trying to do to, the, to cars. And if they do find out, do you think they're going to be happy about this? I don't think they are. I mean, I'm very lucky. I, I speak to real car owners. I speak to people who actually go out, pay their own money for cars some of them are enthusiasts but an awful lot of them because i because actually buying a car is quite a distressing experience i i find it fun because it's because it's what i do but for a lot of people they'll they'll do it maybe once every five years and it's a big deal and you see one of the things coming up now is people are saying well if they're going to ban the sale of you know uh, petrol and diesel cars my car is going to be worth less anyway it's you know it's going to be you know what the government are effectively doing is you know making cars worthless after you know a certain period or certainly worth a lot less but yes absolutely i i don't think this was thought through at all i, I think if, if people had been given this as one of the choices uh, when they actually voted they might have said ah i think you should think about that a tiny bit more because it's been brought forward you know it's been it's been brought brought forward just this year um so it's it's apparently 12 years away and i i could see them saying in maybe you know a few months time now nah, let's make it 10 years then it'd be let's make it five years and it's cre creating uncertainty and there's people who build cars i mean if we had a, like a massive electric car industry and there was a british leyland of uh, you know uh, battery cars here and uh, the government was saying yeah let's let's ban it all because we make the best electric cars you say okay i can see i can see a, a case for that so maybe they're doing it in our interests but i can't can't see any upside to this at all because we don't effectively have a car industry anymore. Yes, I I'm old enough to remember a time when when politicians wouldn't stop banging on about the car industry and about the threats to the car industry and about what effects this might have. Mm. And imagine if if Nissan pulls out of yeah. Sunderland and or, or, or wherever. Mm. Um, has that changed now? Have we given up on cars? I mean, I, aren't I right in thinking the, the 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 big motor show in Germany was was a disaster yeah. this year, and the German car industry is absolutely screwed. Yeah, it is. Yeah, um, yeah. The, uh, the traditional motor show is being you know uh, uh, paired back, and I think I think it's the Frankfurt, the, uh, yeah. which isn't which isn't coming back. Huge show. Um, so that's, that's, that's the end of an era. The, no Frankfurt Motor Show. No, that's right. Oh, my God. Um, yes. well, what does that mean? Tell me, tell, me, tell me the significance of that. It's very strange, really, because if you speak to, um, again, the ordinary person, they, they couldn't care less about it. I mean, I've spoken to people about this saying, well, let's do a big feature on, on this big show coming up. And I say, well, actually, the real car bar couldn't care less because half the cars they have there are what's going to come in, you know, in the future. Uh, it has very little re 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 relevance. The actual car bar, it's a, uh, an industry s circle jerk thing in that, you know, they're all there. They've all got to be there. But increasingly, it's a, you know, a lot of money to spend on building a stand and fanning about for, you know, a few weeks. And they, and they, and they are not getting sort of even a promotional return on it. And you can't even have dolly birds on the stand now. Sadly, not. No, I I remember those those those, those great days. Um, well, why uh, would you know? It, it just seems to me <laughs> so wrong. Given that, look, if you're a a, a fit looking girl of what seventeen or eighteen mm. or whatever old they have them, um, it's good money. It is. I and, know. and 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 hell, if you've got the looks, why not make the most of it while you can? Well, there's draping yourself over a motor. Well, there's a lot of uh, car journalists and sports journalists who should uh, be very ashamed of themselves for being so um, superior so, about all of this because the last, actually, a few years ago, you, you would get sanctimonious car journalists a lot younger than me who would say how dreadful it is. Uh, they would take a picture, but they would say, isn't, isn't this awful? But they do genuinely mean it. They do think it's demeaning to women. And at the end of the day, they are they are just being paid to be there it, it's a job for them um and it's uh, and it's a bit like the you know the the for, for, for formula one i mean you know we're going on 
uh, a slight tangent and this uh, and this probably could be the end of my career in that I'm saying I don't see anything wrong in that they still do it in BTCC you still have uh, 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 the grid girls there what's, what's uh, British is that touring oh, cars yeah the touring cars yeah which is which is which is a working man's for Formula One which is which is a very good I guess what my friend yeah. Matt Neal yeah, uh, yeah, he's, yeah my child, he's my childhood friend yeah yeah um, Oh wow! Do really you know you know? Matt? Yes. You know, my daughter would be very excited. To oh, really? Know yeah, because she thinks he's, he's well. Great. The thing is, he was just Matt who used to Matt and Sophie, his sister. Yeah. We used to go on holiday together. All oh, right. So so all our family holidays when we were yeah. young, Dick and me and and, and Matt and Sophie and, and Helen actually, my sister, yeah. my sister. Um, uh, and uh, so we we don't really think of him as anything other than Matt, yeah. who drives a racing car. But so he so he's do, he's he's done well. He's, he's he's done extremely well for himself, and uh, yeah, because um, he's a team. Uh, you know, he's involved in the actual team itself, isn't it? It's um, it, it, you know, it's a team that he runs. So he's uh, and he's he's won the BTC uh, title a couple of times, and uh, he's been around for a very long time. He's a very good driver, and oh. uh, uh, but again, again, if you compare that to form the. Formula One is, is extremely boring by comparison. It's so boring. Formula One used to be fantastic. Obviously, I, I come from Louder and Hunt, and it was, you know, unfortunately, people died. I've seen that. I've seen that yeah. movie. Yes, but that isn't yeah. that. Sorry, I'm, mate, but isn't that slightly the point? It, it really is. Uh, you, know, it, uh, you know, people were on the edge, and it made it exciting, and I love the fag packet cars um uh, as, as well you know the rothmans cars the, the jps J, jps cars they look black brilliant. jps yeah uh, it, but it was yeah it was a uh, it was a it was a man's job uh, to drive a formula one car and i think it was a lot better and a lot more exciting for that it was just it was just a great time it was interesting but now it's corporate um and it's uh, i suppose very reflective of what the modern world is the circuits are boring you can't tell the difference between them the racing isn't exciting and i but what because uh, yeah. i i went to i got flown to silverstone once in a helicopter yeah. which is the only way you can get in and out because it's so crowded and miserable and i thought it as you know they spend a lot of money on hospitality yeah and so <clears> you, so you're drinking you're in the tent drinking champagne yeah. but the thing they don't tell you but before you go is that you can't hear a bloody thing because there's all these bloody cars going so you've got the nice you've got the, the nice drinks and attractive girls but you've got no ambience at all it's all it's all horrible noise uh it is and also you don't know what's going on if you if you know who's winning i i'd be very no, very surprised so, you have so no what, but so tell me why is it so boring uh why is it boring now? I think I think the drivers don't seem to have a personality at all. The right. rules are very constraining. Um, I mean, years ago, people could do exciting things with cars. You know, one week, someone's, you know, put, you know, like a huge wing on the back. All oh, right, so we're all put wings. Um, but because because they've got such tight re regulations around it, it really should be, uh, okay, have more than one, more than one class, but it should be, do whatever you want. This is Formula One. You know, you want to put, you know, a jet back I on the back. I totally agree. Yeah, oh you, my God. You want, it, you want it to hover. It'd be like wacky races. Yeah, it would be like wacky races. Yeah, make it hover, you know, make it a mile long. Oh no, come on, that's, that's that. cheating. Ho it ho be. Hovering. <laughs> come on, you, I think, I think the, the, in, in our, our, our new motor racing rules, the, the, there's got to be at least wheels touching the ground. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, they're aeroplanes, aren't they? Or hovercraft. Yeah, they would be hovercraft, wouldn't they? But, but, it's but a laugh, isn't that? it? No, yeah. I agree. Mm. Yeah. You'd you'd have mm. this incredible battle mm. between the manufacturers, yeah. and so obviously what we do, we increase grid girls absolutely ex exponentially. exponentially. <laughs> you could do whatever you liked to the car. Yeah. I think probably what we'd do is we reduce the safety regulations so yeah. so that it was much more yeah. much more driver risk. Because because actually, no, I'm sorry. It, you kind of want to be on on the edge of your seat. Yeah. Are they going to survive yeah. this when they overtake on that, that the hairpin bend? Well, this is it. I think that's why people do like the BTCC because there is there is contact. There is there are there are there, there are splinters of, uh, of of wing going and doors yeah, going, and there's drivers getting you know in each other's face afterwards and say, hey, do, "Do they?" This, yeah, it's it's it is. That's why that's why the working man likes. Like to do that. I, you know, usually go to Snetterton uh, and watch that once once a year, and it's uh, and it's fantastic. Uh, uh, isn't it? Isn't it weird, by the way? Um, that racing driver who got got is in a coma because of, the, of, mm. a, of a skiing accident. Yeah. What's his mm. name again? Remember? Schumacher. Schumacher. Yeah, the greatest. Uh, one of the greatest. Is, is, drivers. Do you think he was the greatest? I think he, yeah. That's, uh, uh, um, yeah. I mean, you can't sort of. I mean, it's a bit like. Hamilton now. I know he's in the best car. It's like Schumacher's in the best car, but they make sure they're in the best car. 
um, and so they can they can drive really well, but they're probably very good at politics, which is why which is why they are where. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. Yeah. Do you reckon that had they been competing in the days of Hunt the Shunt and Nicky Lauda, do you think they would have cut the mustard, or do you think they'd have been too bland? I think some of them would have would have struggled. I, I think Hamilton is actually a fantastic example of uh, the power of uh, persistence because he had no money behind him or anything, and it was really um, the, you know the family going going to McLaren and saying this is this is the future, and um, fortunately he could back back it up with his driving skills. But that doesn't happen with a lot of people. There's lots of fantastic drivers who couldn't get the sponsorship, couldn't get who weren't clever enough. And actually, he's been clever enough to get in his position, so he deserves whatever whatever he has. So he he might have done well, but I but I do agree with you because a lot of them it's because their you know, their families have got lots of money, so they sponsor the team, so they get in into the driving seat. Whereas with Hunt and also with Lauda, Lauda had to do an awful lot, although he didn't come from a poor family, but he still had to work really really hard to get where he was. Um, uh, but but again, he was a remark. I mean, Lauda, who, who died very, you know, uh, I think just before Christmas, was a remarkable person. I mean, I, again, I don't think anybody would have been able to have got into you know the driving seat of a car weeks after being so badly burnt. I really, you know, there, yes. there, there isn't anybody who could have done that or who or who would do that now. They were really were heroes. Well, what I was hoping yeah. that's what I was hoping you yeah. say. I was hoping yeah. you were going to tell me that look that none of these people would have beaten Fangio or Sterling Moss or, or whoever because actually the the, the the drivers of yesteryear were cut from a, well, a I think dashing they, cloth. Absolutely, and Graham Hill. But also Hill, the, yes. the, the, the major difference, although uh, motor racing isn't, isn't, isn't my specialist subject, but the drivers of yesteryear actually drove in different classes. So you, you so people like uh, uh, Jim Clark, um, he, he won the British touring cars. So that's how versatile he was. They would drive in rallies. They would drive in the American series because they needed to in order to get paid money to live on. But they were so versatile, they could drive in all these different disciplines. And that's what none of these Formula One drivers can do now. I mean, actually, the, more skill, the most skilled drivers are probably uh, the, the rally drivers because that, that is remarkable how they keep cars on gravel, based, basically. But in the old days, they did everything. And that's what I think makes the older drivers better. Is America our last hope, do you think? Trump's America? Because I can see that, that we're conducting an experiment now, which I I don't see how we're going to reverse in, in, the, in the UK under this green tyranny that's being sold to us in the name of of, of Dominic Cummings'... Is, the, the, this, I worry that, that Dominic Cummings' vision of the future, which is, which is that he thinks that you can run an economy through technocracy and, and pouring government money mm. into science which I don't believe actually works no um, th- that that combining with Boris trying to please his green girlfriend and Gove having got the green bug for some bizarre reason that combination of a very very efficient s- sort of uber spad and a prime minister who's, who's who just intergreened virtue signalling and Gove seems to me a sign that we are doomed, you and I, certainly, and all, all those of us who believe in, in, in petrol. Very sad it is. I can't understand what's what's happened to old uh, Boris because he used to write car reviews. He um, did. I, uh, did he used to do them in GQ? I think he did. Yeah, he Before did. GQ got totally Before cut. GQ, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, his, his ear has been turned and maybe it is his girlfriend, I don't know. Um, but I, uh, but uh, again, to re- re- repeat it again, I don't think anybody voted for this at all because they would have voted green. You know, I would have voted green if I didn't want to drive a car anymore. Um, but this is being done for me by a conservative government. So I don't really understand that. We didn't get the option mm. from any of the parties. That's, no. that's, that's the, there, was, there was no... I mean, it's not like Labour would have been any better. No. That's the problem. Mm. We haven't been given a choice. Mm. And th- that, there seems to have been a kind of... We won the Brexit vote, but there seems to have been some kind of coup conducted by the kind of people who are essentially the Remainer class. Mm. Yet again, the Remainers have ended up on top in defiance of, yeah. of what the, the British people actually want, would you say? Absolutely. Um, uh, the real world isn't, isn't on Twitter, um, but everything seems to be decided there and everybody seems to want to please everybody there. Um, and I, I really don't understand why um, we, we have gone down this route. I mean, 
my book Demotrized is is trying to put this right. It's trying to bring it to people's attention. People can write a better book than this. People can write a more scientific book than this. Um, and what I want it to do is to is to spark a tiny bit of debate. So that, you know they can say, well, Rupert's a lunatic, uh, but maybe explain why it might make people look look into things a bit more. And that's and that's what I uh, and that's what I want. But there just seems to be a wide acceptance. And unfortunately, this is in with the, within the car industry. And I do quote most of the big manufacturers they've all signed up to this it's it, you know it, it is a big cabal in the same way that the big oil companies have signed up to the to the anti co2 agenda yeah they, that's right they've 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 all they've all promised that, that mm. we're going to we're going to sell fossil fuels without selling fossil fuels in the future yeah that's right uh, how does that work <sighs> it, it, it's it's extraordinary the corporate well, that's the subject of a whole other podcast it is. corporate yeah. cowardice yeah but but the manufacturers are are the most cowardly of the lot, and then you see you find it quite strange because then we have the VW cheating um, with the emissions. Yeah. So uh, what they did was actually very clever. That's what I- I- engineers do. You know that, that there's a you know um, uh, you know a fantastic little chip on board that says oh I'm being tested for emissions so I've got to do this I've got to lay down and I've got to I've got to alter things and I've got to re- reduce it. How fantastically clever that that, like that, that is chip. it is it's brilliant isn't it so german technology is being dedicated <laughs> towards ev- ev- evading <laughs> the testing right. procedure absolutely so they did that and then also volkswagen were also found to be um, testing the emissions on on monkeys so there, there were these poor oh you don't know about that oh no, you, no, no, you do read, you, you, yeah, absolutely you do have to read it um but yeah they actually uh, put monkeys in uh perspex cage perspex cages uh, they put obviously the fumes in it's a bit like the beagles smoking years ago because yeah. you'll remember that and so and then they would look at the you know the uh, uh, the, the lungs and the tract and the uh, uh, and the various passages to see how they were affected by it and so i wouldn't say there's very many companies could actually come back from that so if a, if a if a major company was found to be testing emissions on and they also did it on humans they did that in germany they tested the monkeys on in an american good company that yeah <laughs> good, <laughs> they, good well i do i do allude to that and um but uh they, Fine, but, old tradition yeah that's right but they did the monkeys in uh by with uh, an independent um uh, testing facility that was you know as far away from them as possible but they still got caught out and uh, and to me i can't understand why in this virtue signaling woke world a company that's tested things on an um, animal which I think we can all agree is 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 these days a very wrong thing to do. Never mind testing them on humans, but they seem to have got away with it. And actually, Volkswagen sales went up. You know, the you know the, the next year this is either underreported or the people have just swept it. You know, to one side just say, oh well, don't worry about that. That was just that was just uh, an a- aberration. But also. Uh, when it came to cheating, um, the only people that Volkswagen settled with are the most litigious. So in America, they've settled. In Canada, they settled. In Europe, apart from a bit in Germany. So anybody who bought uh, a Volkswagen here that was a diesel and had the cheating software, fine. Right. I think Steve Malloy has written about about the way that the Environmental Protection Agency in mm. the US has actually conducted particulate mm. matter experiments on on humans yeah is that the same thing Are you, you're talking about particulate matter that's that that, that um well, monkeys, these are, monkeys are being exposed to fumes yeah, yeah. to see what but it wasn't epa this was this was a volkswagen yeah yeah sure sure and they did it with some other ma- manufacturers but, but do it, we know what happened to the monkeys are they I, I don't i don't know whether they're they're they're, they're living a you know the life of riley in the caribbean um on their compensation claims. Well, they or, wouldn't do or, that. Or, Come or, on, no, or, be, be or realistic, James. They wouldn't. They wouldn't rehouse them in the Caribbean. They might give them, in, I don't know, in Darmstadt. What happens? Yeah. I don't, what happens in Darmstadt? I, maybe so that's the place you would, you would send a monkey to retire with 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 lung injuries. I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I don't know about the condition of the monkeys um, at, at this time. But it, but it is the fact that they did use monkeys, right? And uh, I, I, my. My point with that is that I think if any other company did that, they they would be shut down. Uh, you know, they would there would just be such um, you know uh, an outcry. But they seem to have got away with it, and they and VW are reinventing themselves as an electric car company now. So they so, say, so well, forget all of that stuff. We'll just we'll just make battery cars, and you'll forget about everything. Yes, I I I wonder whether rather like the oil industry that the the motoring industry has has painted itself into a corner mm. by allowing the enemy to dictate the terms 
and sucking up to the enemy and gi- yeah. giving Dane Gelt to the Danes mm-hmm. and then suddenly discovered that actually the Danes aren't going to go away. They're actually there to destroy you. Yeah. Is that that's what's it is? Well, uh, also a lot of car companies, Ford in particular, have invested a lot in ride sharing um, and Uber type services and apps and so forth because they are scrabbling around because they're just thinking, well, yeah, cars are going to go, aren't they? So we better. They're, so they're they're looking into transport solutions. And in fact, one of the wackiest thing that a lot of manufacturers are doing now is electric scooters. So you know, if you go to Europe these days, they're, they're not over here yet, or they they may be very soon. Everybody's doing on those park and ride scooters, and they just sort of dump them on one side. And uh, I've seen these yeah, a lot around right. European yeah, cities. That's it. So a lot of car manufacturers either invested in them or make them. Audi were the uh, made uh, announced that they were making one the other day. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, again, if you're talking about the regression in engineering, there, there you go. It, it's it's right there. Volkswagen are, are, are quite involved in that. Um, and so what what they're doing it, it's to offset their their carbon they're saying well we're making loads of these zero emission uh scooters no yeah so that's so that's that's their vision of of the future as well they want they want the last mile of the journey to be you on on your scooter. it's all about playing the game isn't it it's yeah, all about finding is. dodges exactly to 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 eke out their business model their doomed business model yeah. for a couple more years in a way it's very hard to feel so, feel sorry for these people I mean, get work, go broke. They are the worst of the worst, but I don't know whether they are going broke. I mean, just look at some of the um, uh, uh, the car ads. I mean, I've I've written about this. I've been one of the few people who've written about this, and I I and I did an article once about a year ago. Why do why does it, I think it was I think it was Mercedes hate their customers? And it was it was an American advert, and it was a dad dressing up as a woman to keep his daughter happy. He was dressed as a fairy to go to, a, and it was it was just so bizarre. You just thought, really? Um, and it was all very woke and it was just, just dreadful. But they're not the only ones. It's a bit like now uh, you have the Renault adverts with lesbianism and Vauxhall as well. Yeah, and not, Again, I bet it's not fun lesbianism. Like no, because at the end of the day, nasty, boring you know, lesbianism. anyone wants to be a lesbian? I couldn't, most of we couldn't care less. But why is that part of your marketing? You know, I, it... it it, it doesn't bother me because if, if you're thinking, well, I'll market this to lesbians, the, the percentage of lesbians who buy cars is, is really, really tiny, isn't it? The, you know, the percentage, it's a few percent, whereas the majority percent... Blokes, oh, yeah. hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, but that's the point. I'm not a 40-year-old watching, watching the ad get, get getting excited. I'm, you know, I'm an old bloke thinking, hey, what's the point of that? I, you, you just don't get it. And, uh, and this is the thing. And again, people aren't pulling them up about it. People aren't saying, I mean, I... Uh, there, there's something I can't mention to you, which I will mention um, off air off about air, yeah. it, um, because it will get me into trouble. Where I did say to a manufacturer, "Are you serious about this?" Um, because it was so woke, it was it was off the scale, and they said, "Okay, we'll speak to you privately." <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, so they are the worst of, uh, of the world. They are. I don't think they've got, they've got any clue, and I'm not quite sure whether they will go broke. Right. Um, well, you can now whisper uh, when we turn turn off the magical recording device. You can whisper the dark secret about the motoring industry. Um, well, James, I think we've 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 covered a lot of um, a lot of miles there. Um, James Ruppert, author of Demotorized, uh, which is. I, 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 I'm gonna gonna be depressed yeah. if they're not because it, it's a world we've lost. Um, unfortunately, yes. I mean, we were alive when things things were great. I mean, I was uh, fully operational in the seventies and eighties, and I can't think of a better time to be alive. <laughs> the music yeah, was great. Well, Never the kids that. think that as well. The kids actually envious for having lived through the eighties, like we yeah. used, like we envied people who'd lived through the sixties. Yeah, you know what were the doors really That's like, it, yeah. and, and, and were the drugs really as good? Yeah, actually, I think they were just talking rubbish. <laughs> I, d- I think, and actually, most of the people who lived through the sixties didn't live through the sixties as portrayed in things like Easy Rider. They were the exception, I think, rather than the rule. No, that's right. Well, not not someone living in Kidderminster. I don't think live, live in through Kidder. It. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Right. Well, that that was pretty much where my parents did 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 not far. So, uh, and they definitely didn't see any of that. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely not. Uh, so we had to do it for them, uh, uh, their kids. Anyway, um, thank you, James Ruppert. Um, and um, thank you everyone for listening. Bye-bye.